Hi people, I'm Dr. Kit and I am a bee scientist as well as a massive, massive animal lover. And so I'm really excited to be talking to you today about bees and how we can help the environment and how our lifestyle um, and our you know, choices can make a massive difference to saving bees and saving the environment. So, yeah, to start off with, I'm a native bee ecologist. I did my research in Western Australia, which is an amazing place for biodiversity with so many different native bee species there. Um, and I've discovered and described new species of native bees, and there's actually hundreds of more that remain to be discovered. The sad thing is that most of our native bees have no protection, no legislative protection, even though some of them are only found in a handful of places. So that means that it's even more important for all of us to choose actions every day that can make a big difference to native bees and the habitat they need because we can't rely on um, governments or legislative um, protection for them. It's pretty much all down to our actions as individuals and we can make massive differences. So I've been researching exactly how we can help our native bees. And so I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about that. So let's start off with what are bees? So bees are a group of essentially vegan wasps. Uh, they evolved from a lineage of wasps. And the thing that makes bees different from wasps is that they have a diet exclusively of nectar and pollen, whereas wasps, they do eat nectar, but um, they often prey on other insects for their offspring or they will lay their eggs inside other insects. But bees essentially decided to go vegan and I'm sure all of us think that's a great lifestyle choice. Um, so they're, they're very closely related to wasps. Now we can tell them apart from wasps as well as flies because of very, very morphological features. They have two pairs of wings um, rather than one pair like flies. They have long antennae with a kink in it, whereas flies have short straight antennae. Their antennae are sort of in the middle of their forehead, whereas on wasps, it's lower down on their forehead and their eyes are big and oval shaped, whereas flies, they have big bulgy eyes and wasps have more kidney shaped eyes. And most bees, but not all, um, have pollen carrying hairs. So they're quite fuzzy, but there are some bees that um, swallow pollen, so they've lost those hairs. Um, whereas wasps and flies tend to be not very fuzzy, but we do have some exceptions as well. So yeah, they're a bit hard to distinguish sometimes, but those are some of the traits that you can use to determine if when you're looking at an insect, it is a fly or a wasp. They evolved well before humans evolved. They evolved during the time of the non-avian dinosaurs and um, they evolved at a critical time in the evolution of life on earth because they evolved not long after the first flowers evolved. Um, and you can see that the um, greenish um, color that represents the flowering plants, they diversified very rapidly after they first um, evolved from plants that didn't have flowers. So that's conifers um, and bryophytes and also things like lichens and moss. Um, and the reason why flowering plants evolved and diversified to become so successful is because of their coevolution with flower visiting insects of which bees are one of the most important. So they're so important for plant reproduction because they act as pollinators, allowing plants to reproduce with cross-pollination. So when a bee goes to a flower, it's seeking the nectar, um, they have a mutual relationship, they get pollen on their bodies, they go to another flower, the pollen, which is essentially plant sperm, is rubbed off onto the female parts of another flower of the same species. And so plants, that's how they have sex, that's how they reproduce, um, and bees get nutrition in this relationship. So it's a co-evolutionary relationship, so important, each of them uh, working together and evolving together. Um, and you know the beautiful diversity of flowers that we see, the beautiful colors and scents, they didn't evolve for us, we are benefiting from that. They evolved for the bees. Um, 
and bees have amazing color vision. So that's why so many flowers um, are beautifully colored. So as I mentioned, this is a, a mutual relationship, a win-win relationship. So the bees get nutrition, nectar for energy, pollen for the proteins and vitamins and minerals and fats, and then the plants get to reproduce. Now, the bee that most people know about is Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. But this is an introduced species, so it's not actually, um, you know, co-evolved with our Australian flora. It was introduced for honey um, and then crop pollination um, during the 1820s to 1840s. And so they occur in managed colonies by beekeepers and then they go feral, which is a problem for wildlife because the feral bees can take over hollows that our possums and our parrots need. Now, WA has one of the healthiest honeybee colonies. So um, contrary, I guess, to some of media, honeybees aren't declining, nor are they threatened. Um, and the problem is that as an introduced species that is very successful and very abundant, they can harm our native bees and our native wildlife. And that was part of my research, um, which I've published. And if you want to grab any of my publications, send me an email, I'm more than happy to share it with you. So yeah, honeybees, they get a lot of attention, but they are a managed species. They're sort of like um, cows or chickens. They do, you know, they do need to be cared for, but they aren't part of the native ecosystems. And that if there's too many of them, they can outcompete our native bees and harm and disrupt the pollination networks. And yeah, it's a sad thing that the honeybees get all the attention and funding because they aren't the ones that are threatened and can harm our native bees. So what can we do to make sure there, that there's a balance? Um, feral honeybees need to be humanely um, controlled. So if there's a feral colony, a beekeeper can go and take it and then keep it, oh, sorry. Um, limit backyard beekeeping because we really need to focus on the native bees and make sure that there's enough floral resource for them, prevent swarming. And the biggest thing, absolute biggest thing, make sure that there's patches of native vegetation, planting more native flowers so that our native bees have enough food because they've, as I mentioned, they've co-evolved with our flowers in the Australian landscape. So that's what they need. They need our native flowers and we need to make sure there's lots of that. We need to limit land clearing so that we have plenty of native flowers so that honeybees can't take all the resources so that there's not enough left for our native bees. So the thing with honeybees is they do make honey. Most of our native bees don't make honey. There are a few species, um, the Melopinini, also known as sugar bag bees, um, but they aren't in Southwest Western Australia. So you can't get honey from them. Um, and, you know, a big thing that I always say is that we shouldn't protect bees for what they can do for us or whether they can give us honey or whether they can pollinate crops because every single species is, you know, a unique product of evolution that is never going to evolve again if it becomes extinct. And so, you know, we are just one species in the ecosystem and we need to learn how to live with all the other species so that we can sort of be in a balance and in harmony. So it's not about what the bees can do for us. We should protect bees because they have just as much of a right to be on this planet and inhabiting the ecosystems that they inhabited well before we came here, well before honeybees came here as well. But yeah, the honeybee industry is very important and honeybees are important of pollinating many crops that um, you know, we rely on for food. So they do have their place in more of an agricultural setting. So our native bees though, the stars of the show, there is over 2000 species in Australia, um, over 800 in Western Australia. Many of them are found nowhere else in the world. We have a unique bee species composition and our bees look fantastic. They are so many different species, habitats, habits, lifestyles, flower preferences, nesting habitats, colours, shapes and sizes. So it's just um, such a unique opportunity to go and find out more about them. And, you know, there is actually so much more that we need to discover about our native bees. For many bees, we actually don't know what they forage on or many plant species, we actually don't know what pollinates them. So there's big knowledge gaps here and even how many species there are. As I mentioned, um, 
there's about 2,000. And we say that because there's about 1,660 described species, but we know that there's hundreds of more that haven't been described, haven't been discovered, given a name. And if we can't give them a name and recognize them, we can't properly protect them. But as you can see, absolutely beautiful um, native bees. And all of these um, can be found in your backyards. I did my PhD um, around Perth. So I didn't go out into, you know, the wilderness. I just literally did it places like Kings Park, people's front yards and backyards. And these are the sort of bees that you can find. Um, our native bees are very different from honeybees. So that means they have different requirements. Um, most of them are solitary, which means that they're more vulnerable. Um, they don't live in colonies and they don't care for their offspring. So they have to get all the nectar and pollen resources, each female by herself, no workers, no help. She also has to be the mum. So she's the mum and the worker and the forager. Um, and she puts that all in the nest. There's some semi-social bees. And then we have eusocial bees that have a similar lifestyle to the honeybees. Those are the ones that make small amounts of honey, the sugar bag bees. But as I mentioned, they're not in Southwest Western Australia. Our bees also range in size massively. We've got bees that are the smallest in the world, two millimetres long, and then some massive, big, bombastic bees, the xylocopa, um, which are um, 25 millimetres long. Some of our bees are very fuzzy and hairy. Other ones, no hairs, like that tiny little bee at the top there, that's Urea glossina malia, about three millimetres long. Um, we didn't even know it was in Western Australia until 2014. We thought it was very rare, but then I found it sort of everywhere. And I think it's just because it was underappreciated, which just shows, um, you know, there's so many tiny bees that we don't even know exist there. And most of these bees, very specialised, um, which I'll get to. So how can we help them? So unlike honeybees that will visit many, many different plant species, our native bees are very fussy. I'm very fussy. Um, so um, not only, obviously, if I go to, I don't know, a deli or, um, you know, McDonald's, I can't eat anything there because all of them have meat. So, you know, it's sort of the same with native bees. If we don't cater to their dietary preferences, they're going to starve. They're very specialised and fussy. Some of them will only forage on eucalyptus blossoms. Some of them will only forage on native peas. So we need to focus on these um, plants that our native bees specialise on. So, um, yeah, making sure that we have big patches of native flowering plants in our gardens and, of course, along our verges and protecting bushland, whether it be in urban areas or agricultural areas. And then, you know, the wilderness, making sure that those areas are protected. There are some um, exotic plants that our native bees like, and you know, fortunately, um, those are things that we like, like herbs, like many of us love to put herbs on our food. And so they love those sort of herbs like thyme, um, rosemary, um, and uh, those sort of uh, flowers. But yeah, most of them do prefer native flowers. So we need to make sure, protect the bees, protect bushland. Um, and that this is, Based on my research, um, I've published numerous papers where I've looked at what the flowers are present in a habitat and what the bees are actually visiting. And most flowers in a habitat aren't visited by bees. They might be visited by honeybees or they might be visited by birds or butterflies, but um, native bees quite specialised. And so, yeah, this has been really reinforced in my research as well as when I was comparing people's gardens and the bushland remnants, the bushland remnants were the most important. So protect native vegetation. We can also help bees with uh, nesting resources because they need somewhere to nest. With habitat destruction, that gets rid of trees. Many of our native bees live in tiny holes created by wood boring beetles in the trees. Um, so they need intact ecosystems. Now, when these are destroyed, we can put up bee hotels, um, which are blocks of wood with holes drilled in them or bits of bamboo bundled together, but they need to be designed correctly. You need to make sure the hole diameter is the right size, um, avoid treated wood um, and put them in the right places. So again, I did um, some research on how to make good bee hotels because many of the ones that you can find in places like Bunnings are poorly designed. But the great thing is that it's quite easy to make them yourself. 
We've also got ground nesting bees, so we need to not put pavement over everything, um, keep patches of bare soil so our ground nesting bees have somewhere to live. Pesticides are another thing that can harm bees. Um, we don't need to use them in our gardens. In some agricultural settings, unfortunately, they are um, needed um, because the problem is that sometimes if they're not used, it means a farmer is going to clear even more native vegetation to make way for their crop. So targeted pesticides that only target a specific pest, sometimes they can actually be beneficial if it means less habitat loss because habitat loss is the driving force um, threatening bees. Likewise, herbicides, they can um, remove flowering resources. Um, some weeds are actually great for bees. Um, and, you know, in an agricultural setting, if you're having a monoculture, that's usually not great. Um, but in um, some cases, herbicides, if they are removing invasive exotic grasses that um, outcompete the native wildflowers, sometimes they also have their place. So it's less black and white, but in most settings in urban areas, they're not needed. Now, the, the biggest driver, as I've said, of bee um, endangerment is habitat loss. And a big driver of habitat loss across the world is land clearing for agriculture, especially livestock agriculture. So um, the bad thing, you know, the bad thing about livestock agriculture is that it is not suitable for native bees. Um, cows and sheep compact the soil so the, the ground nesting bees can't nest in there. If you've ever seen a cattle field, there aren't many trees, which is, of course, really bad for the cattle. There's a few trees. It's mostly grasses. Now, grasses don't provide nectar and pollen for bees, and most of the grasses that are grown for cattle or the grains that are grown for cattle are not um, flowers that, you know, they don't flower. They don't have flowers, so they're not good for native bees. So it's essentially a desert for native bees. In addition to the habitat loss aspect, um, cattle and sheep and other livestock contribute to climate change, firstly through clearing, you know, um, treed landscapes. So trees draw a lot of um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, release oxygen when we clear them. Um, of course, that means there's going to be more um, CO2 in the atmosphere. And then um, ruminant livestock, they release a lot of greenhouse gases in the form of methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, so they contribute a lot to climate change, which we know uh, threatens human livelihoods as well as biodiversity, but it's particularly um, devastating for bees because many of our native bees are only active for a few months during the year. And the flowers that they rely on, remember, they can't forage on just any flowers. And these flowers have short flowering periods. As you know, maybe the Mary, the Carimbia califila, it only flowers for a couple of months. And if we've got a drought, it might not flower. And if it does, there's not enough nectar. There's not enough nectar flow. Um, so we're seeing the effects of climate change already. Um, beekeepers are, are noting that, you know, there's there's poorer nectar flow. And of course, at least with the honeybees, beekeepers can move them around, they can supplement feed them. Our native bees are on their own and completely reliant on these resources. Um, there's also shifts in the synchronicity between the flowering period of bees and um, the flowers themselves. And so that means they can be out of um, synchronization the bees will miss the peak flowering, the flowers will miss their key pollinators. In Australia, as well as across the globe, we're having floods, we're having droughts, we're having fires, all um, harming native bees and their habitat. And increased CO2 in the atmosphere is also making the plants less nutritious for bees. So uh, climate change, habitat loss, the overarching factors threatening bees, as well as biodiversity as a whole. But the great thing is that all of us can make a massive difference through small choices every day, reducing our meat intake. Meat intake. This is a paper um, that's published in Science. Now, Science is one of the leading um, scientific journals, and um, you can reduce um, your carbon footprint by over 50%. Um, and the um, from the paper, without meat and dairy consumption, global farmland use could be reduced by more than 75%. So that is a massive difference. So 
yes, these are big threats. They can seem a bit overwhelming, but all of us can make a massive difference, which is very, very uplifting, gives us a lot of hope, I think. Um, and yeah, I did, oops, I did publish um, a paper about this um, in terms of especially the biodiversity aspect called Defending Biodiversity Through Our Diets, which was published in Austral Ecology. Um, and basically I just drew together all the scientific literature on the impact that livestock agriculture has on biodiversity from a very biodiversity perspective. So, you know, habitat loss, um, reducing um, the amounts of um, good vegetated habitat, um, increased pollution into waterways, um, increased pollution into the Great Barrier Reef, climate change, of course, um, altering, um, you know, natural cycles. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the oceans, um, reducing calcification of marine invertebrates. So have, you know, Diet can make a massive difference to the world. And of course, you know, it's it means that there's less, I guess, pain and suffering in the world for animals as well as humans, because humans are, you know, suffering from the effect of climate change, especially in poorer countries. So yeah, we can make a big difference, especially when it comes to biodiversity. And, you know, that's what I love. I love biodiversity. I love the diversity of wildlife that we have here in Australia. And it makes me very sad. Um, sometimes even depressed um, how much uh, land clearing is going on. And, you know, I know that there's native bees that are very specialised and restricted and their habitats are being destroyed before we probably even describe or know about these species. But, yeah, there is a lot that we can do and that uh, gives me a lot of hope. Um, if you want to learn more about native bees and contribute to citizen science, I do have a Facebook group, The Buzz on Wild Bees, where you can take photos of native bees. Um, they are like that. It's a beautiful, very um, getting in touch with nature activity, going out there, watching flowers, you know, that, you know, take time to smell the roses, take time and smell the native wildflowers, but get there with your camera, sit there and enjoy nature. You can hear the bees, you can hear the birds. Um, and see if you can take some some photos. They are challenging, but yeah, I can help you ID them. And I've got some citizen science projects on bee hotels as well that you can tr contribute to. Um, if you want to learn more about how to create a habitat for native bees in your garden, what flowers are actually best for them? Um, we've got a book here called Creating a Haven for Native Bees, which you can email me about. Um, and that has a list of plants as well as how to make good bee hotels. Uh, if you want to learn how to identify our, you know, brilliant diversity of native bees, I have a guide um, that can help you learn how to do that. Again, you can email me that for that. And, you know, if it's coming up to uh, July, August, and one of our coolest bees, Amagilla dorsoni, um, it's active for a few weeks in um, the Carnarvon Gascoigne region. And I've got a book about that. So if you wanna find some of the coolest bees, I recommend going for a road trip up there. They're very, very cool. And you can learn more about that bee. Um, and then I also have some artwork, um, some native bee um, designs about what flowers to plant as well as different native bees. I can show you my t-shirt. That's one about Amagilla species. Um, the blue banded bees that um, are really important because they do buzz pollination, which is essential for things like tomatoes and honeybees actually can't do this type of pollination. Um, I also have some bingo cards for you to try and find some local bees in your area. And then I have a YouTube channel, which has many videos about how to make bee hotels. Um, I also have an Ask Me Anything segment. So if you have any particular questions about bees or about science or about how we can, you know, eat for the planet, um, just drop me an email or a DM on my Instagram at bbaybet underscore performer and I can do a little YouTube um, about that. I also have a Patreon that um, I will share any scientific articles there um, for free, of course, um, and updates about my research behind the scenes, any new native bee discoveries um, and things like that. So that's my Patreon, the Bee Bay Bet. Um, now, I do have a performance all about pollination. I was here at Perth Fringe um, 
at the start of this year. Um, I, it's a science comedy and a way of getting, you know, alternative audiences into pollination and into bees. I hope I'll be coming back and doing that soon. But if you have any friends or family um, on um, the East Coast in Queensland, I have this performance that I'll be doing and they can tell you all about it. And yeah, stay tuned because I'm sure I'll be coming back to Perth and doing that sometime, hopefully not um, too distant in the future. But thank you so much for um, Perth Vegan Festival for inviting me to speak about our native bees, um, the beautiful diversity we have and what we can all do to help um, save our native bees. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Keir. Does anyone have any questions for her?